Welcome back and thank you for joining us. Uh, this part of the show is where we look at uh, mental health matters and all things to do with psychology. Um, stay with me because I'm just going to read out something that came out in the census. The uh, transgender and non-binary people have been counted for the very first time in the 220-year history of the census for England and Wales. It revealed that 262,000 people identify as a gender different to their sex registered at birth. Now, the England and Wales census also recorded sexuality for the first time with 1.5 million people people aged over 15 or 3.2 percent identifying as gay or lesbian, bisexual or other sexual orientation. Uh, the charity Stonewall, which has long called for the inclusion of gender and sexual identity questions, described the results as an historic step. Uh, Canada has also um, recorded similar uh, figures. Now, a, a lot of people I have to say it's it's I don't include myself in this, but a lot of people will be asking why is LGBTQ plus? Why is it um, so prominent? Why do we keep hearing about it? I've heard people on this station and callers into and many other stations say, uh, why do there seem to be so many LGBTQ or transgender or you know, why? Why is this such a thing at the moment? Uh, well, one reason is because people feel that they can talk about it um, more easily. That's not to say there aren't significant barriers and discrimination but that's one issue. Uh, is there anything else into the equation? Well, this is a question of my next guest. I, I'm thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have. I know he got a huge response last time he was on the show. Uh, from Israel, Dr. Sam Vaknin, a professor of clinical psychology. Sam, welcome back. I mean, our last talk, I, I, I can't you, tell you how Good interesting it was. Love it, you. love it, love it. So, Jen, Gender wars and the emergence of a uni gender. As I said, I mean, so many people are saying, why is this a thing? What's going on? What is your take on this? This is part of a historical process. Um, the two world wars created a shortage of males. And then uh, capitalism has transitioned into a paradigm of eternal growth, constant growth continuous growth, which required the introduction of women into the workforce and also as consumers. Of course, we only have 24 hours a day. And if you spend your time at the workplace and then spend even more of your time consuming, then you have less time left for family, intimacy, marriage, and so on and so forth. And there has been a tectonic shift in the way genders interact and team up to reproduce and to perpetuate the species. This is um, one of the greatest revolutions in human history, uh, in my view. And the outcome was wow. the emergence of what I call the unigender. The unigender is a sex, a genderless person someone who identifies less with social constructs such as gender, stereotypical male or stereotypical female, and identifies much more, for example, with a career or with a lifestyle ah. or with a sexual preference or orientation rather than with gender. Gender was an organizing principle. Gender is performative. It's a social construct. It's actually a script. Mm -hmm. It's a form of acting. And so now we have different other scripts. So studies by Lisa Wade and many other scholars have, are showing that women are defining themselves as masculine, while men didn't complete the transition from masculine to feminine. And this is called the stalled revolution. Women have become men, but men have remained men. End result, we have so, a single so gender. So, so let me. When you say that, when you say it, that, that's taking it away from the social construct of what a man does and who he is and and what have you. Because before, up until recently, um, we had all sorts of, a, as you say, a script for what men were, identifying by what they did, their jobs, their roles in the family, etc. And likewise with women. With the erosion of that, with both sexes having, you know, with a lot of crossover. 
if you take yourself away from those constructs, from those definitions, like a man puts out the rubbish and does what have you, you then become what floating between the two. Because what, what I find is interesting in many African societies, before colonialism, before uh, invasion and all this, before slavery, because the tribe had to work together to get the harvest in, they couldn't, you know, one lot do one thing and one lot do another. Everyone had to work together. The constructs of, of male and female that we have in the West that we recognize, they weren't like that. And so you had many quote unquote genderless people that you looked at and you couldn't I readily identify as being a male or a female because people enveloped both sides just to just so the tribe could exist then along comes faith and religion and what have you and says no men do this women do that um but it, it, it's something that ha existed centuries or uh, you know hundreds of years ago and you're saying now it, it's it's coming back if you like it's coming to the west yes what's happening now is not that the the genders are exchanging scripts uh, it's not a swapping of scripts. It's a conversion, right. convergence on a single gender. And the gender is masculine. Yeah. Everyone is becoming masculine, regardless of genitalia. Now, um, the construct of gender had emerged um, originally when people began to create surplus wealth. Prior to capitalism and prior to industrialism and prior to urbanism, we had hunter-gatherer societies. When we started, when we transitioned to agriculture, following the agricultural revolution, we started to generate surpluses. Surpluses accumulated as wealth, and you needed to you needed to transmit this wealth from one generation to the next, and to do so. Mm -hmm you needed to control reproduction. You needed to be sure that your child is your child and not someone else's child. And to do to yeah, accomplish yeah. this certainty, you needed to imprison women, essentially. <laughs> to imprison yeah. women, to, to yes. keep them sequestered. And this is when gender, gender roles emerged, culminating in the Victorian era. But today, of course, the emphasis is, is not so much on reproduction, there are numerous mechanisms for transmitting wealth. Everything is contractual. Mm. Scripts are fluid. Sex is fluid, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's no need for the old constructs, such as family, such as marriage. Marriage had declined by fifty percent. That's five zero percent from yeah. 1990. <laughs> we don't need these institutions anymore. Yeah. And one of the institutions we are getting rid of is gender. However, it is very unfortunate that we have converged on a single gender that is toxic. Both women and men. Why? Why is it toxic? It's mm. toxic because women have adopted a male role model, which is psychopathic, narcissistic, aggressive, bullying, disempathic. Women did not adopt a male role model, which is hardworking, altruistic, empathic, loving, compassionate, caring, and protective. Women are emulating and imitating the worst conceivable men. And men are doing the same. So we have a toxic convergence. We, the unigender is but a why, toxic but why, but, so, so why is that? Why is that? Is it because uh, it's still seen as uh, all of those negative values that you talk, the narcissistic one, the aggressive ones, are still seen as the tools of power. Is it because being male or being seen as being more male or having more quote unquote male qualities is seen as the path to having power and control? Men have not become more feminine. Men have remained mm stereotypically masculine, almost a caricature of masculinity. Women have transitioned to toxic masculinity rather than men. Men have remained stuck there. <laughs> so we have a situation where everyone agrees that values such as ambition, callousness, ruthlessness, 
suppression of empathy, competitiveness, um, and so on and so forth, everyone agrees now, men and women alike agree, that this should be the guiding light. This should be the northern star of one's life. Today, two and a half times more people say that they would prefer a career to a relationship lifelong. 38% of people oh, in, in the United States are lifelong singles by decision. So we, we have created a masculine world, which is a caricature of what ma real healthy masculinity is. And then we have adhered to it, mm. male and female alike. And this is the unigender. It's a toxic, sick, pathological construct. Now, what about gay gay men then? A lot of people would say that, uh, and it's a generalization, I know, because, uh, you know, but uh, a lot of people would see uh, very gay of you, like very camp men, let's say camp, because, you know, you could be camp and, and not gay, but very camp men as having uh, what we see as female qualities. Or is that just the guys? Is that a caricature of female qualities? Many, many women would tell you that the best thing that could happen is having a gay friend, someone you can trust without the, without the constraints of sexual expectations and even sexual assault. Because sexual assault is on the rise. Sexual practices are heavily influenced by pornography, yeah, yeah. heavily influenced by pornography. And these practices have entered the daily sexual practice of the vast majority of young people under age 35. Mm -hmm. Sex today is a ritualized form of extreme aggression. Not, there's nothing there really? anymore. You think that... Yes, please. Really? I mean, I mean, there are people like Andrew Tate. I don't know if you've heard about that influence as Andrew Tate. Uh, and then there's the incel, you know, the whole incel movement as well, which is women hating, uh, feminine quality hating, if you like, and promotes uh, violence against women and what have you. But, I mean, many of us would see that as, as something that's fringe. But but let's just come back to the previous point, that when with gay or very camp, camp men, then where do they lie in all of this? Do they not have more, quote-unquote, feminine qualities, or is that a guise? Feminine and, feminine and masculine, as I said, are, are social constructs. So, of course, a guy yeah, can be yeah. feminine. <laughs> a guy can be feminine without being gay. Femininity is simply a set, a list of traits and, and behaviors which denote, for example, enhanced empathy, caring, and connectivity, rather than aggression and competitiveness, which are stereotypically masculine. But um, gay, gay men aside, I don't see any other enclaves of femininity, even among women. And when I said that sex is ritualized aggression, regrettably, it's also among the gay community. Sex in general is mm. becoming way more aggressive. For example, the incidence of choking on, on sexual dates has quintupled in the past 10 years alone. Anal sex had replaced vaginal sex as the main practice. And anal sex is very painful to women. So the, there's an orgasm gap. Women experience orgasm six times less than men in most sexual encounters, which are not committed, which are not in committed relationships, and so on and so forth. And these well, well, obviously, because, prevent... obviously, we just went. Sorry, Sam. Just because we're talking in the day, we've got to be slightly less less graphic. But do you think that's because of the rise of? Of, of and you mentioned pornography and um, you yes. know we talked on this show about many young people learning about sex through pornography but let, coming back to the role of the roles of men and women and, and what you're saying about women becoming more uh, you know taking up the 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 negative qualities of being uh, masculine is that the way do you see that's the way it's going to go that's the way it is is it a is it a fad is it a tide or is it this is this is what's happening to humanity um that we'll see more and more and more uh it's interesting that i'm just thinking of uh, apparently there are more when it comes to actually uh, and that's another issue about people who say um i'm not born the sex that i i am if you like and having um 
you know, changing their gender through, through um, you know, surgery and what have you, there's quite a big increase. I know that there's a big increase in women, at least if they don't go the whole way, but re- having their breasts removed. Um, and there's quite a big increase between uh, more so uh, than women doing that than, than men, because it's, it's so difficult to come from a position of, male power, if you like, to, um, you know, transitioning to a woman, because it's, it's it, you've, you may have the operation, what have you, but then your status, uh, everything changes so much. So, you know, do, do you see this basically, I'm asking just to, to finish up, is this the way it's always going to be? Is this a t- the beginning of a tide? Or is it a trend? No, I think that's the way it's going to be. And I think that's the way it's going to be for several reasons. One, women men have uh, men have walked away men going their own way men have walked away they refuse to accept responsibility they refuse to commit they refuse to invest they refuse to form families they refuse to engage in relationships um and so on and so forth in the absence of men women have to be men they have to fend off for themselves they have to work hard they have to make money they have to attain financial independence and they can't trust men to be there for them as they used to. This is point number one. Point number two, uh, capitalism and the and technologies, various technologies, encourage women and men to be atomized. They encourage them to be self-sufficient, to need no one and to interact with no one. Mm. Because there's a very simple trade-off. Any minute you give to your spouse, any minute you give to your boyfriend, any minute you give to your child is a minute taken away from Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And so there is a built-in incentive for technologies and capitalism to destroy your intimacy and your human relationships because they take you away from them. Capitalism today is built on an unsustainable paradigm it's built on the paradigm of eternal growth. And so for, for capitalistic societies to grow eternally, they need to generate consumption all the time. They need to, to interpolate you. They need to brainwash you into consumption. Now, if yeah. you are, if you are um, 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 a single and you work, then consumption becomes your religion and your anxiolytic, your anxiety yes. redu- reducing activity. You consume in order to reduce or control anxiety. And that's precisely what capitalism wants, the current iteration of capitalism. So everyone is encouraged to live alone, to consume Netflix, to consume online, to not pay, to not interact with other people because it takes away from profit. Everything is bottom line oriented. And of course, women play the game because it's the only game in town. And the irony wow. is... Wow. The irony is, this is a male game. It's not a female game. Third and fourth generation feminism sold out women to men. Because today, women, today women construct themselves to fit into a male world. They, they behave, they convert themselves into sexual objects for the male gaze and the male grasp and the male use. It's, wow. it's, this yeah. is more of a... Ma- There's a lot there, of, Sam. This is... The I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just like, whoa. There's a lot, there's a lot there, and I'm, I'm sure, I mean, I'd love to dis... I'd love to discuss it even further. I know there's a there's a lot there, a lot there. Sam, I I hate to cut you short because uh, it is a very it's very provocative what you're saying, and I'd love to go into it further. And indeed, we must on another show, but unfortunately, have run out of time. But wow, lots to think about, Sam. That's why I I love talking with you because it makes you know, smoke come out of people's ears and go away and consider things and at least think things through so please sam do come back and join us on a a future show uh dr sam vaknin there uh, professor of clinical psychology and if that doesn't make you think 
However you think about that, I'm sure you're all arguing about it somewhere in your household and what have you, but at least we made you think. If that doesn't make you think, nothing will. Dr. Sam Vaknin uh, there um, on why he thinks says is that we've all come to one sex and it's not just about sex, it's about society, it's about consumerism and a whole lot of other things. Wow, lots to think about there. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back to your phone calls and messages of which there have been lots. Back in a moment. You know, sometimes, um, you know, one reads something or one is aware of someone and, and my producer, Carla, and myself would say, let's get this person on the show. And we think, oh, will we ever? It's just a dream if we can get that person. Aha, fanfare, we did. Um, think of all the terms you know about narcissism, the way in which it's written. And a lot of that will be thanks to my next guest, who is in Israel. We're crossing live to Israel at the moment. Um, uh, Professor of Clinical Psychology, Sam Vaknin. Um, let me give you just a little bit of a background. He's a leading authority on narcissism. He's a pioneer of the field. Uh, he's a professor of psychology, clinical psychology, a scholar, author. Uh, and as I said before, a lot of the language involving uh, around narcissism uh, has been created because of him. Uh, and I'm absolutely... I mean, I'm overwhelmed. I'm really happy that we are joined by uh, the professor, uh, Professor Sam Backnin, live from Israel. Um, Sam, if I can call you Sam, thank you so much for joining me. I mean, this is this is great because every time I read an article, up pops your name. Can we get him on the show? Yes, we did. Um, Sam, can we start off with a definition of narcissism because i'm sure lots of people think it's lots of different things and it may or may not be correct so let's start with that well first thank you for having me and thank you for the extremely kind words hopefully some of them are deserved <laughs> we'll have to see about that <laughs> narcissism narcissism is a healthy phenomenon gun or eye everyone has healthy narcissism healthy narcissism develops in early childhood it, it propels the child to explore the world because you need to be a bit grandiose to take on the world apart, away from mommy. And so, but when this, when this remains as a feature of an adult personality, then we are talking about the pathology. Now, the narcissist is someone who is incapable of regulating his sense of self-worth, his self-esteem, for example, by himself. So what he does instead, he outsources this function. He reverts or resorts to other people and solicits from them, elicits from them, what we call narcissistic supply, which is a fancy term for attention. He asks for attention, but he doesn't simply ask for an unbiased type of feedback. He wants people to tell him that he is godlike. He is grandiose. He creates a facade. It creates what we call the false self, which is a piece of fiction. And this false self is everything that the narcissist is not. It's all-knowing, it's all-powerful, it's infallible, it's perfect, and it's brilliant. And that's what the narcissist does throughout his life. He goes around coercing people to tell him that his false self is not false, but is very real. And of course, this creates a lot of problems in interpersonal relationships, anything from the workplace, to the family and, and that's what i'd like to go through because uh, you know um it, it, it's, let me just ask you is it uh, uh, a mistake to think of the narcissist and i'm sure a lot of people think of a narcissist of somebody who's going around and very bombastic can they often seem quite you know shy or withdrawing are there many types of persona that they they show because uh, you know looking through your work i i think i've come across narcissists who seem very almost seem humble and oh it's not me and what have you um and so you know and you think well they're not a narcissist because you're always expecting someone who's beating their chest <laughs> yes indeed that's that's very true we we make a distinction between overt and covert narcissist. The covert narcissist is shy, ah. fragile, vulnerable. The covert narcissist is actually a narcissist who cannot secure attention, who fails to secure narcissistic supply by applying directly to potential sources of supply. So what he does instead, he 
wallows in self-pity and misery. He, he engages in displays of pseudo-humility, false modesty. He is very cunning. Um, he is passive aggressive. And I'm saying he because until recently, until about 10 years ago, 75% of people diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder were men. This is no longer true, by the way. Right now, it's 50-50. Mm -hmm. Women have, with this salubrious trend. What is common to all narcissists, whether they are sulking in the background and just sabotaging and undermining everyone, whether they are overt in your face, I'm the best, I'm godlike, and you should acknowledge this type of narcissist. What's common to all of them is regarding other people as instruments, as functions, instrumentalizing other people. Other people are there to cater to their emotional and, and psychological needs. Other people are there to serve them, to admire them, to provide them with supply, to, to simply create an ambience or an environment where the narcissist's grandiosity, his inflated, fantastic self-perception is never challenged. So that's their role. And if they don't comply with this, he just discards them. He devalues them and he discards them. And he could he can be very cruel when it comes to devaluing and discarding. It's very abrupt and it's really, really sadistic sometimes. Uh, we're talking about narcissism. Um, uh, Sam, just as you say that, uh, and I wanted to look at narcissism in three different areas, social media, Surely, uh, you know, b before social media, I would have thought you had to do most of this face to face or on the telephone or what have you. But social media must be what a great tool to the narcissist. Yeah, social media simply amplifies the narcissist ability to tap into people's vulnerabilities, people's insecurities, people people's own narcissistic tendencies, because narcissists idealize you when they start to interact with you they idealize you and then they project onto you your ideal image and that's very captivating it's very addictive suddenly you see yourself as flawless and perfect and brilliant and that's irresistible the narcissist captures you this way captivates you and, and kind of renders you a slave in effect so social media is an amplification device. So definitely narcissists regard social media as stomping grounds and hunting grounds for potential uh, prey because they're predators. Uh, can they become troll? I'm just thinking some of the things when you, when you say they, they'll praise you, praise you, praise you, they'll idolize you. But then if you slip, if your crown slips, for instance, um, I'm just thinking a lot of trolls, I've thought, you know, uh, it's not just a debate online. It's almost like, uh, and they usually start off with, I always thought you were amazing, you were great, you were this. But now, and then it, the, the tables turn and they go after you and after you and after you in, in a vicious way. There are two types of narcissists online. Uh, social media is only one kind of platform online. You have, for example, YouTube, which in my view, <laughs> tends to attract narcissists far more than social media. Um, so there are two types of narcissists. The first type of narcissist is I'm a victim narcissist. It's a narcissist who presents himself or herself as a victim. They adopt a victim stance and victimhood becomes a determinant of their identity. They are professional and career victims. They are proud of their victimhood and they leverage their victimhood to garner sympathy and attention. They, these would be typically covert narcissists. Now, overt narcissists mm -hmm. would tend to woo you, idealize you, and then if you don't conform, if you don't obey, if you're not obedient, they would then, as I said, cruelly and publicly, if possible, devalue you, shame you, humiliate you, degrade you, and punish you. That's their way of punishing you for not having fitted in and not even having provided them with the feedback that they are godlike and perfect, etc. Ah, 
Let's talk about narcissism, uh, narcissism in the workplace. Is a narcissistic boss good for the team? Do, are they a cheerleader of the team? Because everybody, you know, they're, they're saying, I am God, I can run everything. And it makes the team feel, yes, we're behind someone who's going to help us to win. Or can they be destructive in, in business situations or a bit of both? Opinions differ. There are psychologists who claim that high-functioning narcissists and even psychopaths, psychologists like Kevin Dutton and others, even McCobby, they say that even psychopaths are good for business and good, for and good in leadership positions and good in certain professions, for example, medical surgeons. Um, there is an overrepresentation of psychopaths among chief executive officers in Fortune 500 companies and among certain medical professions. There's an overrepresentation of narcissists in show media and, 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 and show business, I'm sorry, and, and various media and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, so narcissism, psychopaths gravitates to position of exposure or authority or both. And, but it's very misleading. It's very, it's Fata Morgana, it's a, it's a mirage because the narcissist claims to have a vision. The narcissist has the vision thing, right. as the Americans like to say. He presents an agenda of, which is essentially grandiose and therefore usually unrealistic. And then he, because he's charismatic and he's very convincing and he knows which buttons to push, he spent a lifetime pushing other people's buttons and rendering them functional and instrumental. So he, he is good at assembling a team and then leading the team. But to understand the role of the narcissistic boss in the workplace, we need to review extremely briefly, I promise you, three concepts. The first one is internal objects. The second one is grandiosity. And the third concept is pathological narcissistic space. I'll start with the last. Pathological narcissistic space is simply the physical place the narcissist goes to or frequents in order to obtain supply. Mm. So the workplace, would be a pathological narcissistic space because that's where the narcissist obtains his supply. The second concept is internal objects. The narcissist is incapable of interacting with real people because he lacks empathy and he doesn't read social and, and other types of cues very, very effectively. So he never interacts with real people. What he does, he creates a representation of you in his mind. In, and this is called introject. And then he continues to interact with that representation, never with you. So that's a second crucial factor because it means that the narcissistic boss regards the workplace as his playground and regards his employees as internal objects, as extensions of himself. He doesn't see them as separate entities. And the last thing is grandiosity. The narcissist's only project in life is to aggrandize himself fantastically. And he just uses the workplace, leverages it, and everyone in the workplace to pursue this project. In other words, the good of the company, the good of his employees, the well-being of everyone are utterly besides the point. The point is to be great again. Him. Thank you. Thank you. We, 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 we're going to take a short break, but when we come back, let's talk about what it's like to be in a relationship with a narcissist. I'm talking to a uh, professor. Welcome back. I'm uh, crossing live to Israel to uh, speak with Professor of Clinical Psychology, uh, Professor Sam Vaknin. We're talking about narcissism in what I have to say is that absolutely uh, they're saying in the studio, you can hear a pin drop. Um, we've talked about narcissism, uh, social media uh, and, and things like YouTube. We've talked about narcissist, uh, narcissistic bosses. Now, being in a relationship with a narcissist, let's talk about from the person experiencing that how do you know you're in a relationship with a narcissist what sort of things do they do to you in order to keep you feeding what they need that's an easy one because you are never in a relationship with a narcissist the narcissist is incapable of 
perceiving you as a separate entity with your own needs, preferences, priorities, personal history, wishes, friends, family, etc., etc. The narcissist regards you as an internal object, as I said before. He regards you as an extension. He regards you as an instrument, the equivalent of an internet service provider. Narcissists seek essentially four things in a relationship. I call them the four S's. The first one is sex, obviously, then services, mm -hmm. then supply, narcissistic or sadistic. You could be the narcissist punching bag or, and sorry, safety. The narcissist has abandonment anxiety. He needs to believe that you will never abandon him or dump him or discard him. If you provide two of these four, you're in but you are commoditized, mm. you're a commodity. You're utterly replaceable, utterly interchangeable. You, you, the narcissist cannot perceive you as unique in any way, shape or form, because it would negate in some ways his uniqueness. What the narcissist does do, mm. once he has internalized you, he idealizes you, as I said. He creates a totally imaginary figure which is not even loosely related to who you are, and then he continues to interact with that figure, with that internal object. But then he grants you access to this object. And by, by seeing yourself through the narcissist's gaze, you become addicted. You fall in love not with the narcissist. You fall in love with the, with the way that the narcissist sees you. It's the first time that you are actually allowed to fall in love with yourself as a mother fall in, falls in love with her child. So it's a kind of self-parenting. It's a kind of self-love from a parental point of view. And it's irresistible. It gets so, you addicted. So I was going to say... So I was going to say uh, so many things. That, so if you, if, if he sees you as an extension of himself, uh, and we're using him and it could be her, anything you do quote unquote wrong away from that idealized picture he has of, he or she has of you, then you shame them. You, yes. you let them down. You, uh, uh, and and but then it also suggests that he or she would be open to, uh, if you don't measure up and you're not meeting one of those four S's, he has no problem. He or she has no problem either having an affair or moving on to the next person. And bam, you never existed. Yes, you never existed. That that's the thing that most most victims of such relationships find difficult to digest. You were never there. And he was never there. The narcissist is not about a, is not a presence. The narcissist is an absence. There's nobody home. It's like a huge black hole with, with a galaxy of internal object, objects swirling it. But the core is a black hole. And so he, he digests you, he consumes you, he assimilates you, he converts you into an idealized thing because he's ideal and everything inside himself has to be ideal as well. This is called co-idealization. So he idealizes you, mm -hmm. and then he expects you to conform to this static snapshot. It's not a video, it's a snapshot. And he expects you to freeze. He expects, he mummifies you like an ancient Egyptian mummy. And if you at any point yeah. deviate or diverge from the snapshot, he's going to respond ferociously. He's going to devalue you, and he's going to discard you because you have dared disbalance the precarious structure that is his personality or what passes for his personality. Is, is it in a constant state of panic? So does a narcissist ever know they're a narcissist? Well, I don't know about narcissists, but they are fully aware of their behaviors. And most of them are very proud of who they are. They consider themselves the next stage in the in the evolutionary ladder because they are invulner, invulnerable they are impermeable they are superior they are amazing they're godlike and so on and so forth and humanity has catching up to do you know and so there's a lot of what we call cathexis there's a lot of emotional investment in the disorder which is why it's very difficult to heal or to cure a narcissist because they think that what we call the disorder 
is actually a competitive edge, a competitive advantage. They think it's a great thing. Narcissists will tell you, without my narcissism, I would have never, I would have never accomplished what I had accomplished. Without my narcissism, I would not be creating. And so you're trying to make me an average person. You're trying to make me a common, common chap, and I will never accept this because I'm not, I'm unique. The, these are strong resistances and defenses. I remember going on a, on a website once for people, support for people who had family members who were narcissists. And I went all the way through it. This is a long, long time ago. And I got onto a page and it just said, run. <laughs> Maybe that's a little <laughs> bit, that's a little bit cruel. <laughs> you're nodding, you agree? If, if so, yes, you know. Yes. Uh, actually, you're, actually, you're, it's my, you, actually, historically, it's my advice. In 1995, I designed a set of strategies which I, which I, and I coined the phrase, no contact. So the no contact set of strategies is the only one that I recommend. If you are in a relationship or pseudo relationship with a narcissist, cut your losses, get out now. And the reason you should get out now is because narcissism is contagious. The narcissist provokes in you narcissistic defenses, dysregulates you, makes you in other words, crazy to, to put it simply. Yeah. Absolutely. Let, let me just show people your book, Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revis Revisited by Sam uh, uh, Bucknane. Uh, Sam, uh, just amazing talking to you. We've had so many calls, so, so many uh, texts and messages, people begging for us to have you back on again. So if you would absolutely do, do the favor for us, because I might, the, the switchboard's gone, gone mad here. People want to hear what I'm pleasure. saying. I'm Thank you so I'm much for your for time. You. Thank you. I would me. love to talk with you again. Uh, absolutely amazing. Professor of Clinical Psychology, Sam Vaknin there, and we will try to get him back. joining me and thank you to all of you on X who are joining me. Let me tell you what's coming up. Uh, we'll be talking with a herbalist about what she believes the power of herbs truly is. Uh, plus, um, a, a young man who's running from underground station to underground station to raise money for calm. Why he's doing that, why he feels male's uh, mental health is so important, as indeed it is, uh, his own story, we'll be talking with him a little later. But I, I guess the spotlight has been very rightly on what's happening uh, in Israel, what's happening in Gaza at the moment. Uh, we've talked with a very powerful talk, which I know has affected all of us, uh, with our, our imam and um, our, our rabbi, who we got actually asked to, to stand by throughout the program in case we, we need them back in again. We may well be talking to them before the end of the show again. Um, also, we've talked with Julia Samuel, psychotherapist, about the effects of uh, seeing the pictures, seeing the headlines, what they, the, the, the way it affects us viscerally. Uh, my next guest is um, one I'm very excited to talk with again. Um, San Vaknin is Israeli. He's in Macedonia at the moment. Um, he's a professor of clinical psychology. Absolutely fascinating. And I'll tell you why he's joining me today. It's to talk about conflict, in particular, the sorts of personalities behind uh, the Israeli-Palestine conflict at the moment. Sam, thank you so much for joining me again. Um, just reading through some of the notes you've sent me, I'm like, wow, this is a totally different and a really interesting take on all of this. Uh, let me start off by asking, and I, I've asked all of my guests, uh, how, are you, how are you feeling? Because I, I don't you know, take lightly that you may well know people and, and, and what have you, and it would yeah. be, I have how hundreds, are you feeling? I have hundreds of relatives in the, in the war zones, both in the north and the south. I haven't slept a wink <laughs> for quite a few nights now, as you can see, probably. So I'm not in the best of shape, but I, I will give, I'll give you whatever I can. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And I know you can't even get a flight back home at the moment. because I can't get are. a flight back. No, Israel is, is actually cut off. Yeah. Yeah. 
you when you look at the personalities and i think there are interesting ones involved when you look at bibi netanyahu he's it's what his eighth time around now and many people are saying uh are pointing out that the reason he quote unquote took his eye off the ball is when you need power at any cost and you bring in cronies people who will back you up um you are often displacing people who are very very learned in their trade in in security in the military and what have you you're displacing them with your uh, your buddies your political buddies what that it seems to me that the need for power underlines so much of the world's conflict and and i'm really fascinating to hear your your views on this the diseased leadership of both the state of israel and the hamas and i'm using the word diseased judiciously definitely clinically mm. has to do with underlying factors which are actually not personal leaders leaders reflect constituencies the psychology of leader, leaders resonates very closely with the psychopathology of their electorates and nations so here we have two peoples two nations and they are both exhibiting what we call in psychology a trauma response now we have four types of trauma response and the most famous of which is fight or flight so in this case we have fight both nations are traumatized and both are in a post traumatic condition as you recall the jewish people has has just had in historical terms just yesterday the holocaust mm -hmm. and the palestinians had something they called the nakba which means in arabic the catastrophe which is the expulsion in 1948 uh, from their territories, which now constitute the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. So they're both traumatized. And when people are traumatized, they tend to perceive themselves as victims. The victimhood, their victimhood becomes their identity politics. And this is called in clinical psychology, competitive victimhood. No, I'm the bigger victim. No, I'm the bigger victim. And they compete for victimhood. And so when you compete for victimhood, when victimhood is who you are, you feel entitled to special treatment. You feel much less empathetic towards the other party. You feel egotistic, you're self-centered on your needs and priorities and so on and so forth on recovery. And many, many victims true victims become very self-destructive. Unfortunately, in both nations, the Israelis who are Jews and the Palestinians in both nations, there's a founding myth of suicide. In Israel, we have the story of Masada. Masada was the resistance in a fortress in the, in the desert against the Roman army. And then all the fighters there committed suicide when things were looked to be you know beyond hope mm. the masada myth is a foundational myth of the state of israel every child learns it it's inculcated in us and the arabs have the concept of uh, the muslims actually have the concept so concept of shahada shahada means martyrdom to be a martyr and to be a martyr is to die. Mm -hmm. And to commit suicide in Masada is to die. This is, this is a death ethos, an ethos of death. Mm -hmm. These are two death cults at war. I know, not politically correct. No, but, but what, 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 it, what, it, what it speaks to then, if you have an upbringing or if uh, you have a society through which such a message runs all the way through 
your way of your your dialogue when we talk about peace dialogue and and often well right from the beginning of the the creation of of israel and what happened with uh, you know uh, with the 700,000 palestinians being displaced it was people from other cultures parachuting in to draw lines either on a map or either in the sand um, with their Western, no knowledge of that. This is what we need to do right from the days of Balfour, historically going all the way through. So uh, even Jimmy Carter, um, but, but one of the things that my husband and myself are talking about is every time there's been a leader from those groups, uh, they've been assassinated. Uh, taken if, if they speak against that language, if they speak one of peace and hope and I guess non-victimhood, they're taken out. Yes, that's because victimhood, as I said, is an identity politics. And like all forms of identity politics, it involves a series of psychological defense mechanisms which lead inexorably to violence. With your permission, I will enumerate these defense mechanisms without yeah. going into too, many, too much detail. Mm -hmm. The foremost mechanism is known as splitting. Splitting or dichotomous thinking simply means I'm all good. My enemy is all bad. Mm. I am perfect. Whoever disagrees with me is evil and must die. This is splitting. It's a defense mechanism that operates in individuals and in collectives. Then you have paranoid ideation. It's me against the world as a victim. I've been victimized means the world didn't help me. So I have to rely only on myself and all the rest of the world are potential enemies. Mm -hmm. I should be hypervigilant. There are conspiracies everywhere. That's paranoia. And then another form of defense is grandiosity, especially if you have existential anxiety if you're not really sure that you're going to be here tomorrow, mm -hmm. if you have true enemies who seek to exterminate you, eradicate you, displace you, whatever, one of the main defense mechanisms we have as individuals and collectives is grandiosity. It's a form of mm -hmm. cognitive distortion. It impairs our reality testing. We don't perceive reality correctly anymore. So Israel, for example, has this misguided belief that it is untouchable, invincible, immune to the consequences of its actions. This is a form of, of grandiosity, of course. And of course, the, the other party, the Palestinians, have their own type of grandiosity. They are the perfect victims. No one has ever been victimized, as they have. That renders them unique. And they're entitled to special treatment and special concessions, and they have rights that impose obligations on others. It's a form of grandiosity, entitled grandiosity. And then we have magical thinking. If we just put our minds to it, there is nothing we cannot accomplish. Mm. Mm. Our thinking, our words, our wishes and dreams and, and hopes, they are reality. We have absolute influence and we can shape the cosmos around us, our environment. This is magical thinking. It's not true. But then reality something is... like this, but, but then something... Somebody takes that action um, that changes that, that friction between two similar ideologies, if you like. Somebody just steps way outside of that. Uh, I guess they have to do something horrific in order to what? Up the ante to become... I'm just thinking with, with, with the Hamas doing what they did, that is a, a massive upping of the horrific ante. Yes, everything I've just described is known collectively as pathological narcissism. Mm. And in pathological narcissism, you need to be noticed. Your existence relies crucially on what we call external regulation. Feedback from the outside, input from others, regulates your moods, your emotions, your reactions, who you are, how you perceive the world, and so on. But how are you going to be noticed? in a rapid news cycle, with two zillion social media accounts, with cats, with cats and semi-naked people all around. How are you gonna be noticed? Ostentatiousness, 
So you need to be you need to become ostentatious. You need to escalate your behavior. And the more atrocious you are, the more abominable and abhorrent and so on, the more likely you are to garner the attention that you need. Mm -hmm. This is, by the way... I was going to say, just let me remind people, I'm talking with Sam Vaknin, who's a professor of clinical psychology. So, Sam, just tell me, and I, from what you're saying then, if you have to escalate things to be noticed to such a horrific level, the media using lots and lots and lots of, of uh, photographs, more and more and more and more and more, that surely feeds the monster. Yes. Actually, um, both parties abuse the media, social media included, mainstream legacy media, social media, all forms of media, all forms of access. It's not only media, it's access. Mm. They abuse this to do something manipulative, and it's called projective identification. Mm. Projective identification is when I force my adversary or my enemy or another party I force them to behave in a way which conforms to my expectations of them and also presents me in a good light. So if I expect you to abuse me, mm. I will provoke you. I will push your buttons. I will escalate my behavior until you do abuse me. And that would confirm my position that you're an abuser. Mm. And that would also make me the good guy, because here I am being abused by you, being victimized by you. And, and that's how they use and that's how they would use those the, the photos and the pictures and what yes. have you. Um does what? Make them more well, uh, they are victims, but it makes sure that you can't ignore that. There are no saints in this uh, conflict. I I think that the problem is that people define themselves as victims. Victimhood is an identity. Being victimized is a series of events and behaviors or misbehaviors. It doesn't make you a victim. It means that you have been victimized. Yeah. Victimhood yeah. is a totally different thing yeah. because it involves entitlement at the expense of another person. And of course the media are harnessed and leveraged and used and abused by all the parties. These are signals. This theory is known in psychology as signaling theory. The parties are signaling to each other via the media and use the media in order to induce and modify the behaviors of the other side in a way that would reflect well on them and would confirm their prejudices and biases regarding the other side. And this is a form of aggression which involves gaslighting, the alteration of, of reality in counterfactual ways, and also involves projective identification. I'm going to make what? you do what I want you to do, what I want um, you to well, do. I was going to say, where does anger is, uh, I mean, not just um, anger from the parties involved, but anger from all of those watching from, uh, well, let me say, like news commentators and what have you, whenever I see shouting and anger around this, it's a horrific issue. But whenever I see colleagues in the media shouting and angry, I see that as them fueling the flames. Um, am I wrong? Is I would beg to differ with the word anger. Not your fault, by the way. It looks like anger. <laughs> Ah. It's it's righteous indignation. It's a form of virtue signaling. Yeah. It's ostentatious. It has nothing to do with real anger. Because you see, real anger is a good thing. Real anger is a way to affect your environment and to modify other people's behaviors so that you won't have to be angry anymore. Mm. This is not anger. This is victimhood. Self-righteous sanctimonious, 100% good, while the other party is always 100% evil. Okay, we, so we've so. got to, Sam, we've got to take a break. I'm going to come back and talk with you more. I'm talking with Sam Vaknin, Professor of Clinical Psychology. Uh, back with more in just a moment.
Welcome back and thank you for joining me. I'm having an absolutely fascinating conversation with Sam uh, Vaknin, who is a renowned international um, professor of clinical psychology, usually based in Israel. As we heard, he can't get back there. He's uh, in Macedonia at the moment. Sam, coming back to it, when you've got two parties who see that almost as a competition of who can be the biggest victim, what is the answer then? How do you create peace when you've got two traumatizers? You explained the, uh, the the Jewish people with their trauma, the Palestinians with their trauma, how you can't do therapy for, for hundreds of thousands of people. How, how, and as we said before, those people who have tried to create peace and become close to it, get assassinated, I mean, historically. Um, it seems that governments, uh, peoples go back to, and you said they made that point, the leaders that they, that mirror their grief. They, Hamas became a, a political party, but still always have that. It's like the IRA with Sinn Féin. It's, it's, it's like with, uh, you know, people forget that Nelson Mandela came from a once terrorist organization. So you've got the, the Jews with Bibi Netanyahu coming back, the Jewish people, yet he gets back again. You've got Hamas. How, how do you... What is the answer? What is the answer? You can't do therapy for hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people. What is the answer? The situation is it calls for pessimism. However, there are two mitigating mitigating circumstances or mitigating mitigating aspects. Mm -hmm. We distinguish between cultures and societies which look to the past and cultures and societies with a future orientation. Mm -hmm. Now, the cultures and societies in the Middle East, the Arab world, the Jews, they are past-oriented. They, Their nourishment is based in the past, not in the future. They derive their sustenance, their strength, their resilience, everything from the past. Mm -hmm. So this is the first thing. If we succeed somehow to change this orientation and to render it present or future orientation, I think this would go a long way towards kind of pacifying both, both peoples. Because well, where where does, that, now... does that come from? I was going to say, because the traditions, everything about uh, both Islam and Judaism, the traditions, everything is, as you say, how you map out your day, your week, your month, your year is based in the past. To change that orientation, does that come from their faith basis? Does that, I mean, if somehow you could uh, approach, we, we had earlier on a, a fantastic imam and, and a, a rabbi who, who have come together and are supporting each other and seem to be speaking of the future. So is that possibly where that focusing on, uh, and basing themselves on the future, is that a place from which it could come? Past orientation has to do with what we call learned helplessness. The belief that everything is hopeless, that regardless of your best efforts, you will never be efficacious. You will never accomplish long-term goals. And everything that you do accomplish is transitory and meaningless. So if we were to establish an environment, and here the Western world has a major role, it's, as does China and so on, if we were to establish an, an all-encompassing environment, which includes, incorporates both the Arabs and the Jews, in a way that guarantees them stability and safety mm. and long-term prospects and economic development and jobs for all, etc., etc., I think the hopelessness and helplessness will abate. And with these, the past orientation will be replaced with a future orientation. Mm, the second a big thing ask. <laughs> it's a big ask it's, because we're talking done, about it's territories. Been done, it's been done before. For example, right. the Marshall Plan in Europe. Yeah, yeah. It's been done before in Japan after the Second World War. The United States is spending six billion dollars a month a year in the Middle East. This money on weapons, mind you. Only on weapons. Yeah. I mean, take this money and use it differently. 
-hmm. Same money, no need for appropriations, no need to negotiate with the Republican Party, same money. <laughs> so this is the first thing. The second kind of ray of light, hope, is the fact that societies in the Middle East, Jews included, are shame-based, reputation-based. The social control is exerted and channeled through shaming people, humiliating them, mm -hmm. criticizing them in public, um, damaging their reputation irrevocably. Mm -hmm. So this, these are the levers of social control. Mm -hmm. Now, this is very bad because you need to save face. And in order to save face, you act irrationally. Like saving, it's save face or die. Liberty, you know, liberty or death. So saving face or death. That's it. Literally, people are willing to die to save face. Mm -hmm. If we were to transition from a reputation and shame-based society to a society of rule of law, objective and neutral measurements and evaluations, a society that doesn't shame people, or humiliate them, but teaches them and educates them and nurtures them, then I think we will have removed another component of this endless, seemingly endless and intractable conflict. Mm -hmm. You see, this is the cycle. This is exactly the cycle. The Jews live in the past. The Jews live in the past. The Palestinians live in the past. Both of them have been shamed and humiliated. Now the Hamas humiliated Israel, shamed yeah. Israel. Yeah. Is Israel acting rationally? Allow me to have my doubts. Is Israel acting proportionately? Almost for sure it's not. Why? Because Israel has to save face. It has to restore its deterrence and it, the respect and the awe that it used to be held in. It's all about reputation. It's exactly like the mafia. Exactly like a mob, a mob mentality, you know. And I so, guess you could say the same about Hamas. They had to save absolutely. face. Uh, everybody yes, say. Do you think it's absolutely. time? To, we, we've got to finish this interview, but I, part of me thinks is, isn't it time that women <laughs> took over? I mean, I say that glibly, but so much of it is bound up in the sorts of things I guess we attribute to to, to men: saving face, muscle, might, aggression. Well, I, those are attributes that are, are very male. We're talking maybe about societies in which the man has a, a role that many would say is adhering more to the past because younger people, as we've seen on both sides, don't adhere as much to that. So part of me thinks maybe it's time for the world to have a good go at women running it. I mean, can we do much worse? I, I well, mean, this, I don't mean to joke. <laughs> <laughs> this might be true in the West, but regrettably in these areas, mm -hmm. in the Middle East and so on, there is full, uh, full collaboration between men and women in, in perpetuating this state of affairs. Yeah. Women have been co-opted. Mm -hmm. Women have been co-opted into the male patriarchy, basically, mm -hmm. into the male mm -hmm. you know, structure. Well, Sam, thank you. As always, it, it, it's it's fascinating talking to you, and I I really am. Um, I, I send you my my warmest wishes. It must be. I know it's a very going to be a very very difficult time for you. It is. As thank well. you. For, yeah, thank you for your sentiments. Like, yeah, thank I, you. and thank you. I, I mean that because all of our guests that we've had from the area, I'm like, God, how you lack of sleep and the churning of stomachs and all of those things going on and even be able to focus or gather their thoughts. It's not something that I take lightly. So I do thank you again. I want to say one last thing. I want to say yeah. one last thing. This is a crisis, definitely. But it's also an opportunity. In 1973, Israel has been surprised. There was a surprise attack on Israel by Egypt yes. and Syria. And it led four years later to peace, yeah. peace with Egypt, later peace with Jordan and so on. Mm. This horrible atrocity committed by the terrorist organization Hamas could be an opening. It doesn't need to end this way. No. You could reconceive of it and reframe it and leverage it to make peace. Mm. Unfortunately, I don't see the leadership there yeah. to do this on either side. It's sad. 
Sam, thank you so much. Thank you so thank much you. for joining us today. Thank you for having Sam, me. You're, you're so welcome. We'll, we'll definitely be talking with you again. I know we will be in the future. Uh, Professor of Clinical Psychology, Sam Vaknin there, uh, as you heard, he's, he's Israeli, can't get back to Israel because there aren't any flights. So he's in uh, Macedonia at the moment. Um, lots to think about there. Lots to think about there. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. And after that, we'll be back on a totally different subject. Our I Believe segment where we hear from a herbalist. Back with that in just a moment. Once upon a time, we used to think of domestic abuse as purely being someone hitting someone. Uh, in the vast majority of cases, although not exclusive, it was about a man hitting a woman. That's how we used to we used to see it. We know it works both ways and we know domestic violence can extend to other members of the family. But that's how it was once seen. But things have become more nuanced and uh, now we've got social media and what have you. And there are lots of different ways of controlling somebody, keeping them in line. Uh, and so the Crown Prosecution Service has had to continually update uh, their definition of coercive control. Now, the latest one uh, update um, guidance sets out the various sophisticated and subtle ways that suspects can manipulate uh, their partners to exert control over their lives and seek to minimize the likelihood of detection and punishment. Notice, as I said, subtle. Now, if you were to tell somebody that your partner continuously gives you presents, gifts, Gifts, uh, showers you with all sorts of amazing presents and praise and things like that and then takes those away and then that's usually not done on its own it's difficult one to tell yourself what's going on here when your friends will probably tell you you're lucky and two, to extricate yourself from that. It's, it's a really complicated issue. And so many times you hear people say, well, if that person was just abusive, just leave. It's not that easy because the art of manipulation and coercive control is insidious, it's, it's gradual, and it's very, very powerful. Uh, there is but one person to talk about this. Uh, I've had him on the show before. Absolutely amazing. Sam Vaknin, is, who is Professor of Clinical Psychology and a leading authority of, of narcissism, which is, this is all part of that. Sam, thank you so much for, for joining me again. Um, you know, as, as I said before, when we talk about coercive control, it's very difficult for somebody to get their head around it, even if they're in the claws of it, to, to, to know what shape it takes. Now, this love bombing, as I said, so many people say, you're lucky. But just talk us through about what kind of control that is exerting and how it manifests. Good to see you again, Trisha. And no, I'm not love bombing you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank it's you. just simply good to see you again. Thank you for having me. I'm a former professor. I, res I, I okay. get my position. So oh. just for, for disclosure. Thank sake. you. <laughs> um, love bombing, as the name implies, is when you weaponize expression of affection and love and compassion and attention in order with explicit intent to manipulate another person into a behavior which you deem beneficial to you. Right. This should be the definition. Unfortunately, so how does it look, Sam? I was going to say, I'm just trying, how does it, give me some examples of how it might look when you say weaponize. Yeah, but allow me, with your permission, yeah, before, yeah, I, yeah. before I proceed, one disclaimer. Um, we need to define, when we criminalize behaviors, we need to define them really, really, really well. Because if we don't define them really, really, really well and delineate all the nuances with precision, we will end up criminalizing romance. We will end up criminalizing sex. And many, many young men are already terrified to approach yeah. young women because so many aspects of intergender interaction have been criminalized, mm -hmm. I would even say excessively. Yeah. Now, this, this is no exception. Love bombing is, is pathological, dysfunctional, and abusive. It's manipulative. 
It's an integral part of coercive control. However, if it is not well defined, we may end up criminalizing totally legitimate, lovely, charming, enchanting behaviors between people. And unfortunately, from the little that I've seen, love bombing is wrongly defined with the, in the Crown Prosecution Services documents. Oh, wow. So, so, yeah. so, so what, so what does it look like then? Where are they going wrong? Because as you say, young here, men here, you know, here are, the minimal, are terrified. Yes, here are the minimal elements that should exist in any definition, proper definition of love bombing. First of all, it should be over the top. It should be unbelievable, incredible. No reasonable person would ever accept the contents of love bombing as real or truthful. Number two, it should be premature. In other words, the compliments, the affection, the attention, the gifts should come too fast and too early. Ah. So on the first meeting, you're the most amazing woman in the world. In the second meeting, there's an often offer of marriage. And at the end of the second meeting, you're already planning to have three children together. And you're <laughs> discussing the college funds. Right. That's premature. Number three, it should be ill-founded. The compliments in love bombing have nothing to do with you. So even you feel, as the victim of love bombing, even you feel that something's wrong. You are being described in a way that has nothing to do with you. We call this idealization. The compliments are actually directed at some idealized image of you, which is totally uh, fictional. So love bombing must include a pronounced element of fantasy. In the absence of fantasy, it simply might be a dysfunctional way of courting or a, a flirting gun or eye if there's no fantasy. Fantasy is, is crucial. Number four, love bombing must be a part of a pattern of behavior, misbehavior, known as coercive control. If it is divorced from coercive control, it should not be criminalized. Right. Number five, number five, love bombing should be a part of what we call in psychology intermittent reinforcement. Intermittent reinforcement means you get conflicting messages fast on the hills on the hills of each other. So hot and cold. I love you, I hate you. I want your company, I don't want to talk to you. Let's chat, I'm blocking you. So uh -huh. This is called intermittent reinforcement. It disorients you. You become disoriented. You don't know how to decipher the other person's behavior. You try to please the other person. You become submissive. You're intimidated. And you're manipulated. Intermittent reinforcement is a crucial part of coercive control. And there is no love bombing without intermittent reinforcement. In other words... So you're, no you're, you're continuously you're continuously trying to keep that person in the, the positive sort of thing. On their now, toes. The, on, their you, toes. You, on their toes. So you said right at the beginning, it comes too early. Now, I remember going back in my single days, this chat, we'd had like the first date I was amazing and and uh, all this sort of thing and I was ostensibly there for a completely I'd been invited there for a completely different reason to talk about mental health what have you then you're amazing and what have you and all this sort of thing and then the next thing he's saying I'm trying to figure out this thing which house we're going to live in and I'm like so are you say I mean that was like the second date and you sort of think whoa 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 now you talked about the uh, although that can't be criminalized to take it from hot and cold and black and white that would still be a flag should still be a flag i'm saying for anyone in a relationship to be wary yes am i right absolutely intermittent reinforcement in the vast majority of cases is a manipulative control instrument it's intended to control it's intended to create such uncertainty in your mind it's intended to gaslight you into doubting your own judgment and perception of reality, uh, of the other person's behavior, their motivations, etc., mm. so that you become dependent on the other person's input. He becomes your reality test. You, and so then you lose your independency and agency. You become an extension of that person. And you, because he has the capability to withhold affection from you, to withhold his love, to withhold the pleasant times together, you want to motivate him to give those back to you. And so you try to please him 
to the point of denying yourself and your needs. Sam, let me let me throw something at you, Sam, because we're talking about in a in a, a relationship. Not physically, I hope. <laughs> no, no, no. We're talking about in a relationship. I've seen this play out in workplace situations. Of course. And and that and and work-wise, and that legally and every other way is very difficult to prove. Where a boss right at the beginning is talking about you're amazing, you're this, or da, 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 da. and then the next bit, uh, you know, you're rubbish and you need me, you don't need me calling you at inappropriate times. I'm only calling you at these inappropriate times because I can't do this work without you. And then you did can it happen in a workplace situation yes, or am I, think, I ah no i think you're very right i think two two additional shortcomings of the cps definition of of love bombing is limiting it confining it to intimate romantic relationships mm -hmm. when it's absolutely untrue it can happen in church it can happen in a workplace yes, it can yes. happen between a teacher and a student it can happen it love bombing is a universal universal manipulative tactic second thing the CPS does not make a distinction between love bombing, which is the outcome of mental illness. For example, people with bipolar disorder, they love bomb in the manic phase. People with borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder love bomb because they can't tell the difference between truth and lies in a fantasy. Mm. People with, uh, with other psychotic disorders, they love bomb because they can't tell the difference between internal and external, and so on and so forth. Ah, these people, yes. these people are not acting criminally. They are just playing out their mental illness. Yeah. And yeah. there's no such exemption or mitigation in the CPS's definition of love bombing. That's catastrophic. <laughs> That's absolutely wrong. And so, it's, so uh, I think the key, the key is coercive control. Is yes. the love bombing? Does the love bombing lead to a coercive control scenario? Is it embedded? in a coercive control strategy? Or is it an, a totally independent behavior that goes nowhere? If it right. goes nowhere, if it goes nowhere, it's just a warning sign. You wouldn't want to have a relationship with someone who jumps to conclusions in the first meeting. Yeah. If it is, however, if it is embedded in coercive control, it should absolutely be criminalized. I fully agree. Because it wow. leads to, it's the corridor that leads to coercive control. Now, with your permission, I would like to give the indications of coercive control. It's up to you. Yeah. You're, you're, well, you're we're just we're just about Sam. We're just about to run out of time, and I don't want to have to interrupt you in the middle of that. What I, I and I did this last time because you, when I talk to you, it generates so much interest. Uh, can we leave people hanging? Can, would you mind coming back on the show? Because this is something that awesome. I, I really, the whole thing about it being in the workplace as well. I know people are going to be like, whoa, they haven't thought about that. And and how the CPS definition needs to be expanded. Sam, we will talk again. Thank you so My much. Pleasure. Sam, Sam Vatten in there with some really interesting stuff about coercive control. And as I said before, we will be talking more about that coming up we've got a, a lot lot more about uh, bringing in legislation that prevents obese people being discriminated against good idea or not that and a lot lot more right after this break so stay with me here on talk tv see you in a moment
this next issue absolutely will. I, I mean, I, I love it when we have this guest on because he absolutely makes me think. He, he pushes the boundaries of where you uh, want to go in safety. You know, we, we always go for the lowest hanging fruit of ideas. And Sam Vaknin absolutely uh, stops. I, I think he stops that happening. Now, if you've seen online and in newspapers, those photographs of lines and lines of Palestinian men uh, being huddled together naked. Um, the UN has spoken out against this, but the IDF, the Israeli Defense for, um, uh, Forces, have said, no, these are all Hamas fighters. That unraveled when somebody in the States found, uh, saw that his uncle who, or, or a relative who was a baker and a 13-year-old and a, 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 a newspaper saw one of their journalists. Anyway, long story short, uh, four of the people were already identified as not, having nothing to do with Hamas. But what it does is dehumanize the others. And there's lots of ways, all sides, all sides in war, dehumanize the other side to make it more, quote unquote, acceptable for politicians, for generals, for et cetera, et cetera, to we have to attack these people. And they use terms that uh, are equating these people to these people, to beasts and animals. Sam Vaknin is, is fascinating on this subject, and I'm delighted to say um, joins me now. Sam, thank you so much. Just reading, doing some research. Uh, behind what you're talking about really made me think again. Let's talk about some of the ways in war that one side seeks to dehumanize the other and why. Um, always, always happy to see you, uh, Tricia. Just for fairness sake, the Israeli Defense Force claims that they had to strip these men because they suspected them of... Um, possessing weapons or carrying weapons. We'll leave it aside whether these men should have remained stripped and naked for hours um, and delve right into the topic that you have raised. Now, war is a very interesting phenomenon because it brings out the best in us and it brings out the worst in us. Where war has been identified for millennia with masculine positive values, such as valor, mm -hmm. heroism, courage, overcoming fear, selflessness, altruism, self-sacrifice for the greater good, and protectiveness. These are all absolutely positive values in an unmitigated, unadulterated way. But in order, mm -hmm. in order to emphasize all these elements of humanity, this is what makes us human. Uh, in order to emphasize them, we need to render the other side a bit demonic. And this is a defense mechanism, a psychological defense mechanism known as splitting. Splitting or dichotomous thinking is when we cast the world in terms of good versus bad, evil versus mm. good, black versus white. We are all good. The enemy is all bad. So this is known as splitting and the enemy is dehumanized, objectified, and demonized in a kind of morality play. So the war becomes a kind of a theater production where there's the bad guy and the good guy, the all bad guy and the all good guy. And of course, we are always the good guys. We are never, ever the bad guys. Now, this is, this yeah, is a kind yeah. of, it's a kind of role play. Um, if you give me two, two additional minutes, I, I want to elucidate a few yes, yes. points. This is a kind of role play. It's adversarial, it's rule-based, but it's a game. You know, when you watch veterans on both sides mm -hmm. meet, when they meet after the war, they are very convivial. They're very cordial. Yes. <laughs> They're like yes. best buddies. It's exactly the way athletes shake each other's hands after a contest or something. So there's a strong element of game or gaming or role play in, in war. Still, war is about winning. And it's about winning mm. because winning validates you. It validates you as having been chosen. It validates you 
as having been blessed, those those of you who believe, having been chosen or blessed by God. And, you know, yeah. it's, uh, it's uh, very awkward to mention it in this context. But the Nazi SS uh, had an inscription on its buckles and on its daggers. And the inscription was, God mit uns. God is with us. God with us. Mm -hmm. God is with us. God with us. Yeah. So winning the war means that you have been chosen and blessed by God's grace. You've been elevated by God. It's a bit of a Protestant thing because Protestants used to believe that if you were successful in business, if you were a moneymaker, that, me that meant that you were chosen by God. You were blessed by God. The same applies to war. That, war, is, war is I was, was, was going to say with... I was going to say as well with politicians, though, in order for them to get the money for war, in order that for them to validate their decision to go to war, uh, to validate the actions that they take, they need you not to see the other side as humans who bleed, who, who cry, or what have you. They need uh, their constituency to see the other side as either good or ba well, bad, bad. Um, subhuman and also equate the people with the terrorist organization for instance all all of the and both sides have done it when we talk about what's happening with with uh between um gaza and israel that they all must be this you know uh they for instance they said the settlers uh all of these settlers so they're not really settlers israeli settlers they were really idf or all of those men we stripped they're all hamas and there's that equating ordinary everyday people with the the the, the boogeyman the monster which then makes it okay uh for destruction to take place i think um it's it's great that you raise the issue of politics because I think war is a collective cultural social activity. War is a great way to bond. It creates bonding. War is a great way to foster intimacy among large swaths of the population. War gives rise to identity, which is often what we call in psychology negative identity formation. It means my identity is everything that you are not. I'm defining my identity in contradistinction and in contradiction to who you are. We both are mutually exclusive. And since I regard myself as human and all good and on the side of God and ethical and moral, you must be the opposite because my identity is yeah. the exact negation of yours. So there's bonding, there's intimacy, there's cooperation, there's innovation. War is the greatest engine of an innovation. Literally all the technologies we use today have been invented during wartime or by <laughs> military organization, and that includes the internet. So yes, this is yes. war. And, and it's very important to understand that war leads to a new order. War is very cathartic. It's a catharsis. It's, it cleanses, it's kind of a cleansing operation, after which there is an opportunity to create something new. For example, I think the current conflict between Israel and Hamas will finally give rise to a Palestinian state. I think the- Oh, you do? I do. I think the Yom Kippur War in 1973 was a prerequisite, was a precondition for the peace between Israel and Egypt and later the peace between mm -hmm. Israel and Jordan. We need war as, as an engine of transformation. Uh, Schumpeter, the famous economist, called it uh, creative destruction or creative disruption. Now, it's very politically incorrect to, to talk about war in these terms as a positive force. Yes, that's going to say. But, but do you but, think... No, I was, I was going to say, but the language, the, the language as well that is used. Let's talk about the language because that's frequently used by newspapers to, um, to, to promote that otherness as well, calling the other side beasts or monsters. I mean, uh, just looking at the, you know, the brief that you gave me and then I look at the newspapers and you can 
the scales fall from your eyes. When you keep reading various reports from various different sources and the various words that are used to equate the other side with animals. I mean, people, the, the remarks you hear will be like, oh, well, you know, the 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 Gazans were just living in like animals, you know, in, in the desert. They weren't very, um, they weren't very developed. There is that belief against that the, the more civilized in Western concepts, the more civilized the society, the more, I don't know, closer to God or they'd be doing the other person a favor. Of course, I'm going to be very sensitive to that because Africa was taken over by people who saw everybody in Africa as savages and need to be uh, educated. And we all know that, God forbid, when the bomb goes off, we know who's going to, the most civilized people will pass, will go first. So let's talk about the, the, the language that is used to demonize the other side. War war and the language the language of of war has to do with a fantasy space war is a fantasy defense in war you as an individual become immaculate become perfect i mentioned i opened my my conversation with you by mentioning all the values associated with war heroism courage uh, protectiveness, mm. selflessness, altruism, self-sacrifice, these are positive values. None of them is negative, not a mm. single one of them. So there's a fantasy of who you are, which is what we call in psychology a narcissistic fantasy. And mm. this is and this fantasy of the individual as a perfect being protected by God, in effect. Even the SS, the Nazi SS, believe themselves to be mm. protected by mm. God. So, under the banner of God, you're a perfect being, and obviously a society comprised of perfect being also happens to be a perfect society, a city on the hill. Mm. Now, you mentioned Gaza, for example, and this is an excellent, an excellent example of how fantasy takes over reality and suppresses it. Gazans have the highest literacy rate in all the Arab world. Gazans mm -hmm. are much more literate and much more highly educated than the Egyptians or the Saudis. So Gaza mm -hmm. is actually an, en an enclave of learning and er erudition in the Arab world. They're definitely not uneducated um, peasants or, mm. you know, they're exactly the opposite. They are urban. Most of them are urban. So mm. here's an example of how we create in a fantastic space um, an image of the enemy that has nothing to do with reality, that is counterfactual, and then we continue to interact with that image, not with the real enemy. Uh, when we, yeah, when yeah. we kill members of the enemy, we are actually playing a video game in our minds. And in this video mm -hmm. game, there's an internal representation of the enemy that is devalued to the maximum, to the extreme, dehumanized, demonized, yes. etc., etc. And this is exactly what happens in the mind of a narcissist. The narcissist converts people, converts external objects into internal objects. Then the narcissist either idealizes this object or devalues this object. But in any case, the narcissist continues to interact with the object, not with the person that they gave rise to the object. So we could say that war is a narcissistic activity. Absolutely. It's about narcissism. Yeah. No wonder that war is very antisocial, and there are many psychopathic behaviors in war. Yes, absolutely. Sam, always brilliant talking with you. Are you still? I just wanted to check how you are. Uh, I wanted to say, uh, although it's a very troubled times, so happy Hanukkah. Um, Thank you. And, and are you? Have you? Have you been able to get back to Israel, or you're still? No, I, I no, haven't still... been there for. for... I haven't been there for too long. I, I intend to go back uh, next year, hopefully when the fighting abates. I did. I served in the Israeli army for three and a half years. I was in infantry and then in the Air Force. So I know war intimately, uh, including urban warfare. Yeah. I've been involved in urban warfare. I know war intimately. There is no, yeah. no more hideous spectacle than war. All these values yeah. that are attributed to war 
That's post facto nonsense. War is dirty and mm -hmm. ugly. Dirty and ugly. Period. There's nothing yeah. else there. Sam, thank you so much. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Always fascinating uh, to talk with you and get another point of view and get people thinking. Sam Vakin in there. Um, 